welcome all of you to this panel on uh, renewable energy in New Hampshire and policies. And uh, these, our panel are, are wonderful people who are all involved around legislation and sustainable energy. Um, it's an absolutely critical issue. But I, I confess I came in and looked at the program of church today and I saw the description of the panel and I was like, God, isn't this awfully wonky for a church service and how am I connected to this and what are we really doing here? And then, as we said, the covenant, um, which I will let our panelists know, that says, love is the doctrine of this church, the quest for truth is its sacrament and service is its prayer. And I was like, okay, now I know how we're all connected here in terms of having this policy discussion and a discussion about the democratic process. Um, what I'd like to do is just uh, introduce the panelists and then we're going to ask each of them to talk for about 10 minutes around some background information on their particular area um, of renewable energy. Um, and then also then have some questions and discussion around that and then really get into what we all can do about dealing with and supporting efforts around renewable energy in the state. Um, there's a handout here. I have a couple more copies um, if people would like it. Because this is very complex and I didn't really understand much of it until I started putting this together and saying, boy, this is a very complex process. It is also one that is very much in play in the state legislature and, and Rennie will talk about it. Um, and it's very much in play in New England. There is just a um, editorial today in the Boston Globe about the importance of looking beyond natural gas to renewable energy. Um, really good editorial saying basically um, allowing natural gas plants to plug the gap would only expose businesses and residents to more price hikes. That's all the more reason for state governments across the region to make an aggressive push for green energy. So I think we're at a very important juncture in terms of what's happening with natural gas pipeline expansion. Um, and how important it is to push for renewables at this point in time. So let me introduce our panelists here. Um, first off is Clay Mitchell, who teaches at UNH on topics of sustainable energy, community, environmental planning, and sustainability. Um, that's the bio he provided. I went on the website and got more about you, Clay. So. <laughs> um, and he's worked with local governments in New England for the past 12 years. He holds a doctorate in natural resources and environmental science from UNH and is a graduate of the Vermont Law School with a JD and master's in environmental law. His primary focus is environmental law and energy project development and he participates at the local and state level developing projects and policies that contribute to economic sustainability and secure energy resources for clients in the public and private sectors. He's past president of the Board of Directors of New Hampshire uh, Sustainable Energy Association, which is one of the things that's on your little map there. Um, and is a member of the New Hampshire Carbon Coalition Local Energy Committee Advisory Group and served on Governor Hassan's Energy and Environment Transition Team. And next we have Doug Bogan who's an environmental organizer and advocate for more than three decades. Doug is really the person whose presentation I went to two years ago on offshore wind that spoke to me about the real hope and possibility of actually having enough uh, green energy from wind offshore. Uh, he's currently director of the Seacoast Anti-Pollution League in Exeter and program manager with the Seacoast Area Renewable Energy Initiative in Portsmouth and a founding member of Seacoast Peace Response. Doug lives in Barrington, is a resident of Hampshire Seacoast region for three decades, and he has a master's in science and education from Cornell. And then my buddy, Rennie Cushing, who is in the fifth term in the New Hampshire House from Hampton, who won his first election, lost or won by one vote in the, the initial one this fall. So, um, and Rennie is the founding executive director of Murder Victims, Families for Human Rights. He's been very active in different human rights issues around uh, capital punishment and also um, was part of the Clamshell Alliance in the early days. Were you one of the founding people of it? Um, and I think this is correct. Did you co-sponsor a bill for the study of offshore wind last term? So that's in terms of his being here. 
He's also the brother of one of my very dear friends, Marnia, and his mom is here today. So, um, without further ado, I'd like to get into uh, asking Clay to start um, talking about sustainable energy and specifically around solar energy policy. Well, it's, it's important that we get out and enjoy today's solar energy, so uh, um, it recharges us in addition to uh, driving our panels. So my, for the last six or seven years, uh, I've been working in this field both uh, as a volunteer as well as uh, starting a business. A few years back, um, we're the ones who are responsible for the solar array at the West Wastewater Treatment Plant and at the Exeter High School and at East Kingston Elementary School and the turbines over at the Seacoast School of Technology and over at Great Bay Community College. So I've been doing this for the last, when I'm awake, I work on it. When I'm asleep, I dream about it. And I'm gonna tell you everything in the next nine minutes, uh, which is not true. Um, I will try to give you the context of our policy. And unfortunately, it's unstable. Um, and, and that's a problem because uh, what's been happening, what's been happening in the, in, the sec, in, the, in, the, in the reality of the sector is, the cost and the price of, of, of implementing renewable energy has been coming down. It's been falling precipitously, actually. Uh, when we did our first array over at the Exeter High School back in 2007, we, we talked about costs in dollars per watt. So you don't need to know what that means other than the comparison. So that array cost us $7 per watt. The array over at the wastewater treatment plant, which was one of our last, cost us about $4 a watt. So the price is falling, and it will continue to fall. The problem is, is that um, people in, um, we, we, have, we do, we have incentives. They're not subsidies, they're incentives. A subsidy is a government program to offset the cost of a commodity. A solar array is not a commodity. It is a market transformation. And so when you have an incentive, you, you are trying to change people's behavior and change the way the market reacts. And so our incentive programs have worked. And in the beginning, the incentives were high because the price was high. As the price has declined, the incentives have declined. And as much as people in the solar industry hate it when I say this, the incentives should go away. But they should go away on a planned program decline. Lately, the New Hampshire legislature has been pulling the plug and plugging it back in, pulling the plug and plugging it back in. And, it, and, and the federal legislature has been doing the same thing. Now the federal legislature is doing nothing, which is actually preferable. Um, but because, for a number of reasons. Um, <laughs> But, so the problem is, is that we have a market that's in transformation, and it's in positive transformation. But, but when, when the legislature sends signals out to the business world and to the communities like you, that we support it, we don't support it, or they try and drag in this argument about climate change, which is irrelevant, uh, but I'll, I'll tell you why I mean that in, in a minute, um, they, they cloud the, the, the future. And banks and finance people, you need money to do this. They, I, that's just the reality. The, the switch is, instead of paying on a, on a weekly or a monthly basis to your utility, you're buying your energy up front with the solar array. You buy equipment that sits there and generates energy for free. And solar, for me, is, is, is a great example for renewable energy because it's virtually zero maintenance. There are no moving parts. The only moving part is a fan that keeps an inverter cool. And now they have these things called microinverters. They don't even have fans. So it just plugs into your house and it generates electricity for free. And so you have, to, you have to switch people's understanding of purchasing energy to an upfront cost versus a long-term cost. Now what, what companies like ours do is we take away the upfront cost and we bill you for the energy at a lower rate. So what that does is it takes away this argument of, well, when's my return on investment? Your return on investment is the day you turn on the system. If, if a company like ours can build the town of Exeter at eight cents a kilowatt for the energy we produce versus going out onto the grid for 12, Every day you wait, you lose money. And so that's the kind of message that we've been trying to get out. Unfortunately, with the, with the variability in the policies, uh, we haven't been able to say that because we don't know what's going to happen. And right now, one of the biggest things that's happening is the, the House's budget has proposed the rating of the Renewable Energy Fund. And the Renewable Energy Fund is a dedicated fund whose sole purpose is to fund uh, incentives for projects like wood, heat, uh, solar thermal, solar electric, and other projects. And if that fund gets zeroed out, as it's currently proposed, you will kill the industry. And here's the reason why. Because the federal tax credit is also scheduled to change. Now, the industry can adapt to that, and they're prepared to adapt to it at the end of 2016. It's going to go down. But if it goes down, and you turn to the renewable energy fund, and there's zero dollars in it, there's nothing. 
We're not there yet where we can do this without incentives. No energy does it without incentives. The oil and gas industry gets billions of dollars in incentives. There's no way that that's a subsidy because oil is a commodity. Um, so what, what we're dealing with here is a lack of leadership. And it's not coming from the top, so it has to come from the bottom. And so that's your role. The, the, to be a part of that bottom-up push to get the legislature and other policymakers to either lead or get out of the way. I never used to say that because I just thought, oh, that was ridiculous. Everybody will get this. It's a business deal. That's the whole point about the climate change thing. I believe in I, I know the science. I know the scientists who do the work at UNH. Climate change is a reality. What I'm holding in my hand is a, is a tack for mapling. I went mapling yesterday. That's why I came down. And I talked to these guys. They've been doing it for decades. They know what's going on. The, the, the temperature patterns are changing. They're not getting the right, uh, the right cycles in the temperature over time. It's always a different weekend that they can start doing the, the, the boiling. It's changing. And renewable energy is a solution for that. And that's not the sole driver anymore. That's, that becomes background noise once you look at it when it becomes an affordable choice about local energy versus importing our energy and exporting our dollars. And so what's happening here is that the, the tapestry, so to speak, is not being weaved correctly so that everybody understands what the policy should be when it comes to sustainable energy. It's about choice. It's about choosing clean energy. It's about choosing a local resource and a local contractor to build your system. And it's about adding value to your home on a residential scale. Same thing on a commercial scale. It's just a bigger system. So what my goal here today is just to tell you that this the kind of graphic that you have, which is wonderful, it's, it, it is a little complex, but it's, it's time for, there needs to be one big thing on that graphic that says leaders. And it's the public, I think, who, who really need to be aware of what's going on, how individual and small steps and little things like rating the Renewable Energy Fund can become a tremendously negative impact on the development of this industry. Um, Revision Energy just opened an office over in Brentwood. They're a larger company. They do what we do on a bigger scale. And, and they are expanding and, and getting more and more people. But if this Renewable Energy Fund gets rated, they're going to have a hard time too. And so it, it, the, the idea that this is something that you sit back and kind of let other people manage is, has to go because the people who are supposed to be managing it are not doing a very good job. And, and I don't think that they're hearing enough about how we're, people in the industry and the public are dissatisfied with this kind of you know, ebb and flow of the policies. And, and that instability is, is what's really torturing the industry right now. And we're, we're leading the, the discussion about our future because we're having to worry about these instantaneous, ridiculous steps that shouldn't be done. This year, we had to fight to keep the renewable portfolio standard from being repealed. We had to fight to keep Reggie in place so that we could continue those funds. A couple of years ago, we lost all the funds from Reggie except for a small amount that was funding projects all over the state, including the town of Exeter, to do efficiency work and upgrades and lead by example. And it's just been a slow erosion of a coherent policy that looks toward a sustainable future. And that's, that's really what I need to say to you in nine minutes, and I don't have a watch, so I don't know if I hit that. Um, but I, I would love to answer questions. If we're obviously going to have time to do that. But, but that's kind of the context. And the only other example I'll give to you, in, and I was calculating it just now, I wasn't texting anybody. The, the state of Massachusetts, just south of us, has had a coherent energy policy, and they have 500 megawatts of solar. And that, that counts out to about 1.8 million panels. The state of New Hampshire has about eight, which counts out to about 26,000 panels. That's the difference. Massachusetts did not implode because they had this massive policy and they're continuing, they're expanding it now. They're going to 1.6 gigawatts, which is the output of Seabrook Nuclear Power Plant. So they just built a Seabrook Nuclear Power Plant on people's homes and roofs all across the state. And it's clean and it doesn't import, it doesn't create nuclear waste, and it puts thousands of people to work. The industry in solar has been growing by leaps and bounds compared to every other industry when it comes to jobs. And this kind of behavior that we're dealing with in New Hampshire, it's a jobs killer. I don't, I don't know how else to say it to you other than it, it just makes no sense. And um, I'm, I'm obviously not happy with it. <laughs> um, I try to explain it to my students and they look at me blankly. They don't understand. They just say, why? 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 And I say, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. So I encourage you to be leaders. Uh, I encourage you to take the opportunity to uh, communicate with legislators at any opportunity you have. 
the rating of the fund is not only silly, it's conceivably illegal. This is a dedicated fund for a dedicated purpose, and the legislature has proposed to rate it to fill a gap in the general budget. The budget is $1.8 million, or $11 billion. The amount they're stealing from the fund is $50 million. It's a fraction of a tenth of a percent of the budget, but it's going to kill the entire industry. And this is not the first time it's been done. The governor did it. And we rose up and, and communicated with her our concerns, and this budget did not include it, but the House's budget did. So that's what I need to tell you. The situation is is dire, for lack of a better term, but I'm not, I try not to be you know, a chicken little running around like the sky is falling, but I, we really need some leadership, and it's really you. Oh. Tell us the name of that fund. It's called the Renewable, Renewable Energy Fund. Yes. Is there a bill number? It's the budget. The budget. Oh, it's the part the of budget. the budget. Yeah, it's the budget itself that proposed to raid the fund. Um, I'll, I'll start off with a little introduction um, besides my uh, bio that you heard earlier. Um, I got started with this initiative on offshore wind uh, really is, is my position with uh, SAPL, and I, I trust many of you are familiar with SAPL. We've been around for over four decades. We actually predate the EPA, if you can believe that, just by a year, but uh, we, we go way back, and uh, we've always tried to kind of push the envelope as far as what's possible and what uh, needs to be done, and, and we were looking at, you know, how can we address the uh, need to stop the relicensing of Seabrook, as some of you know, if they're trying to relicense it for an additional 20 years to the year 2050, if you can believe that, they seem to think they, they know how to run these things longer than any uh, nuclear plant has ever been run in the history of man. That's true. Um, but uh, in any case, we said, well, where are we going to get, you know, 1,200 megawatts of power? Not that we need to replace it megawatt for megawatt, but it, it certainly was to bolster our argument that there was a plan in, in, uh, in effect, really, in, in the state legislature in Maine, and I'll get into that in details in a minute. But um, I uh, heard this news report uh, back in uh, late 2009 announcing um, uh, from researchers in Maine that they, uh, ha that they determined there was enough power uh, in offshore wind uh, in the Gulf of Maine, off the coast of Maine, to replace over 150 nuclear plants. And that got my attention. So, well, we're just trying to replace one. Um, obviously, uh, we'd like to replace all of them in the country. Uh, and there only happened to be 100. And, and we're actually down below 100 now. I think we're down to 99. Um, but um, we really need to be working on alternatives. And this got me pretty excited. And it, <clears throat> At about the same time, uh, friends of mine in the peace community were talking about how can we uh, replace our uh, uh, infrastructure for war, essentially, our defense uh, 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 industry, um, and in particular, our local uh, example of that, the ports of Naval Shipyard. Um, this has been an issue that's been around for a long time. As you know, it's gone up and down as far as whether to keep the shipyard, whether to close it, what to do with it, etc. And... Um, and we started thinking about, well, what, what does it have to offer? What, what does that real estate offer? So I'll get into that a little bit later. But the idea there was that we could join these issues and, and also deal with economic development in the seacoast. So it really started to come together as a whole broader picture. And that's where I came up with this slideshow. I feel kind of like Al Gore. I guess this is how he got started. Um, but uh, it's been, we've been adding to it, and unfortunately it's gotten a lot longer than it started out. I'm going to try to keep it down. I don't know if I can keep it in 10 minutes, but uh, hopefully I can use the bulk of my time to talk about the background and the issues, since offshore wind I think is new to most everybody. It's certainly new to this region, um, this part of the world, in fact. Um, so uh, I expect to spend most of my time talking about that and, and perhaps leave it to Rennie to talk more about the policy issues and going forward. Uh, so um, if I go to the next slide. Um, so we always start with a problem. Um, we have an unsustainable energy system. The, the byproduct of that is global warming, climate disruption, however you want to state it. But I think it's very important that we, it's really a matter of, as Clay mentioned, market transformation. We're talking about a transformation of our whole energy system here and around the world. And I won't go into all the details. I'm sure you know a lot about climate disruption, air pollution, the limits to fossil fuels, peak oil, peak coal. 
um, uh, the inefficiencies of our power plants, including the nuclear plants, and uh, potential catastrophes. I think after Fukushima, hopefully it's a lot clearer that these plants are not entirely safe. And um, most importantly, I think we have fossilized thinking. That's kind of the term I came up with. To, uh, you know, the way people approach our energy issues. The, the, the history has been that we centralize our power sources. We go for these bigger, bigger is better kind of systems and uh, all run from one central location. And uh, that we uh, rely on a, f a, fuel, a few types of fuels, particularly fossil fuels and nuclear. And uh, that obviously has gotten us into trouble. And so we really need a whole different mindset to go along with a whole different infrastructure. Um, so that's kind of a starting point. Next slide. Um, just to give you an example, um, and if you probably can't see it too well in the slide, but uh, this is a nuclear plant that had a little problem with water some years back. This is Fort Calhoun in Nebraska. It's on the Missouri River. They had huge flooding, record floods there uh, back in 2011. And this plant was shut down. Um, it uh, took several years to get it up to being able to run again, and it still had trouble. They just, just literally, like last week, took it off the list of uh, special uh, concern plants at the NRC. Um, so we don't want to go there. You don't want your major infrastructure getting flooded on a regular basis. Next slide. Um, second problem, of course, as I mentioned, Cold War infrastructure industrialization, uh, it's a squandering of our resources. Uh, we have weapons that are in search of targets that were designed for the Cold War. Hopefully we aren't getting into a new Cold War with the new Russia, but uh, um, certainly we don't have the same needs that we did 20, 30 years ago. And, um, and the shipyard is also climate threatened and climate threatening in terms of its fuel use. Obviously the military is a major user of uh, energy in our federal government. Next slide. Um, so I just came up with a, a general concept of what we need to do. Uh, you've all heard of the four R's. Um, certainly around Earth Day, they're always talking up all the, the renewable things we can do and reuse and reduce and so forth. But the S's are sustainability, safety, security, and sanity. Um, there's probably more, but that seemed to encompass most of what we're talking about. And I won't dwell on it a lot, but obviously the, uh, renewable energy uh, meets all these uh, categories. And security certainly is a big one, particularly we're talking about the military. The U.S. military, they get it, you know, that they have spent most of their energy, most of the blood and treasure of our country defending fossil fuels, defending oil, defending the, the transport systems to bring that fuel to us. And I think they're tired of it. They would like to be doing other things with their energies. And um, we need to be thinking along different lines than, and a more, more secure system. And of course, a wind uh, turbine, a solar panel will never blow up on you. <laughs> We're not going to see the Fukushima or the uh, 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 deep water horizon in the Gulf of Mexico, that sort of thing. Um, next slide. Doug, can you just not quite as closely. I okay, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little feedback. No, yeah. Good, yeah. Um, so getting a little more specific, um, this is a report that came out in 2009 that I referred to earlier um, uh, by the uh, Ocean Energy Task Force of the State of Maine, uh, commissioned by the governor. Okay, is that better? Thanks. Um, is that working still? Yes. Okay. Um, and anyway, this report is really a visionary document. It, it talks about the potential for uh, offshore wind in addition to onshore and other renewable sources and the fact that by, by uh, doing what they propose, they could uh, basically fuel the whole state, run all the uh, transportation electrically, uh, provide all the electrical needs, and they'd still have energy left over to sell to you know, slower states like New Hampshire. Um, and uh, we're talking 10, 20 years into the future, they projected to 2030, and they projected they could get 5,000 megawatts of power from offshore wind alone by 2030. And um, that would be plenty enough. Next slide. Um, and then on the federal level, the U.S. Department of Energy put out this report back in 2010 that lays out the broader picture for the whole country. And um, again, it's incredible numbers. I mean, they, they you know, tracked every uh, square mile of our coastline and the Great Lakes and 
all the offshore areas and came up with these uh, figures on what could be produced. In just our little teeny coastline that we all know how small it is, 18 miles and so forth, they projected that you could potentially generate up to 2,600 megawatts, and that's several miles offshore. We're talking you know, beyond the Isle of Shoals. That's twice what Seabrook generates. That's a huge amount of power just from our small coastline. And I'll talk a little more later about what really is entailed there. Uh, but nationwide, we're talking about tens of thousands of megawatts of power, enough to you know, pretty much run the whole state, in conjunction with other renewable sources. Certainly, you need to have solar and wind and biomass and other sources all working together to come up with a system that's going to work 24-7. Next slide. Um, this doesn't come out terribly well in this light, but um, a little bit of geography here. Um, when you look at uh, wind resources, um, it's really important to keep in mind that the best wind is offshore. I don't think you can see it too well in this, but this area, this strip along the east coast, is in bright red, if the light was better, and that's uh, what the Department of Energy considers outstanding wind potential. That's the term they use. And even beyond, beyond the red, there's a little area of blue here and also over here in the northwest, and one little spot in southeastern Wyoming, for some reason, also has the next level highest uh, wind resource they call superb. Um, I'm not sure why in Wyoming, I like to say sometimes that maybe that's where Dick Cheney lives and there's a lot of hot air or something. <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, the amazing thing is that, you know, the, the resource is 10, 20, 30 miles offshore, more so than in the Midwest. I mean, yes, there are a lot, and you've probably all heard about the developments going on in the Dakotas, and uh, Texas has the highest number of uh, wind farms in the country. Um, certainly California and elsewhere, but you go 10 miles offshore and it's a much better resource. There's much more potential. And where do most of the people live? I tell you, they don't live in Wyoming. <laughs> you know, that's why people like Dick Cheney can get elected out there. But, um, you know, most of the people live on the coast, east coast, west coast, gulf coast. And it it's, makes more sense to generate the power near where the people live. So let's focus in a little closer. Next slide. This is Gulf of Maine. This is the coast of Maine from uh, uh, Eastport down to Kittery. And um, this whole area here through here is, is the red, is the outstanding wind potential. Maine has some of the best in the country and the, the best closest to shore up north, up in Machias, Eastport, that area. It's just a few miles offshore is really good, really high wind, better than anywhere onshore. And so the state of Maine is, is starting to figure this out, that this is an incredible resource to tap. This is just 50 miles from the coast. This whole area in red here is what they determined was enough to generate power to replace 150 nuclear plants. So that's where that number comes from. Now obviously they're not going to carpet that whole stretch of the Atlantic coast in wind turbines, but if we just, just did a very small percentage, and you think about 5,000 megawatts is only 3% of that total. 3% of the total area would be uh, devoted to wind farms. And even there, we're talking each individual turbine would be a mile apart or so. Next slide. So coming a little further down the coast, this is the coast of New Hampshire, it's Portsmouth, Seabrook. And New Hampshire's kind of funny in that our our, our official jurisdiction kind of peters out as you get about 20 miles out beyond the Isle of Shoals um, because of the way the borders were determined way back in probably the 18th century. Um, and so we don't have offshore that's further out. But the fact is when you get more than three miles about this far offshore, it's all federal waters anyway. So the state, yes, has some official jurisdiction, but it's really controlled by the federal government out there. So that's really what we're talking about is a federal state program to develop these offshore areas. And certainly you have issues with uh, you know, boat traffic and, and commerce and so forth in the closer area. But as you get further out, you get a lot more open, open waters. Next slide. Um, and just to finish it out, this is Maine, of course, uh, Cape Cod, um, Newburyport, and Cape Ann, and much greater resource down there. They have over 200,000 megawatts of potential uh, of power. 
The one we all hear about down here in the Nantucket Sound is Cape Wind, of course. It's the uh, first to get off uh, the drawing boards and to get uh, permitted, but uh, as you know, it's come into a lot of trouble, mainly because of opposition from uh, folks on Cape Cod who don't want to look at the turbines. I'll talk about that a little later. But there are other uh, pro projects in the wings that are getting built that probably, unfortunately, will get built before Cape Wind. So um, there's a whole lot of the Gulf of Maine, of course, in uh, North Shore, Massachusetts, that also can affect what goes on on the shore in New Hampshire in the Port of Portsmouth. Next slide. So Europe, as you probably know, are way ahead of us, really a decade ahead. They've got uh, thousands of megawatts already installed every year. They're adding more and more. It's just quite amazing how much is being developed in almost all of the European countries. And we're talking offshore in addition to onshore. Next slide. Um, and it's important to keep in mind, these are not, you know, on the drawing boards. Gee, maybe it'd be nice to build these someday. These are <laughs> off-the-shelf constructed full-scale technology that's been proven. These three turbines are in three different parts of the world. This first one, sorry, the typo, type didn't come out big enough, but that's in Norway, and it's run by the outfit Statoil. You might have heard about them because the state of Maine, particularly the governor of Maine, uh, ran them out of town because they're foreigners. You know, we don't have any foreign uh, developers in our, our midst, so they didn't get to build this off of Maine, but they have one operating off the coast of Norway. It's been there for several years and uh, it's, it's interesting in that it's a single pylon in the water. It doesn't have a, a large structure to it, but it is floating. It's not, it's not uh, attached to the, the uh, undersea. This one in the center is in Portugal and it's set up on a, a, a three-legged stool, if you will, also floating. And then this other one over here is off of Fukushima, Japan. Not coincidentally, the Japanese have figured out they need to do more renewables and less nuclear. And um, all three of these are full-scale, two megawatt uh, systems. They're all tied to the grid. They're generating power as we speak. And they've been up for some time now. So again, this technology is there. It's just a matter of ramping it up, building more of them. And now they're building ones that are five, six megawatts. They say even 10 megawatts each turbine, much bigger, twice as tall. We're talking the wingspan of a 747 jet. This is large material here, large construction, and um, it, it has incredible potential. Next slide. Um, Gulf of Maine, we already have one turbine up and running. It's just one eighth scale. You may have heard the uh, University of Maine has set up a consortium of different folks that um, have uh, put together this turbine. Um, it's only 20 kilowatts, much smaller, but it is connected to the grid. It's been up and running for over a year now, and um, they're hoping to uh, ramp it up and build full-scale turbines in the next few years. Next slide. I'm sorry, this didn't come out well at all, but that's a picture of it floating. It's off of Castine in the, the um, Penobscot Bay, um, and uh, it's, it's doing fine. Next slide. Um, and in the next few years, they hope to build a pilot wind farm off of Monhegan Island in mid-coast Maine. This would have uh, several turbines. It would um, uh, generate 100, uh, cost 120 million, generate 340 jobs, and um, it, it, it was approved by the Public Utilities Commission. Again, unfortunately, the governor has not been as supportive. Um, and the federal government uh, actually declined to give them a, an important grant they were expecting, of $50 million. So it isn't going to get built on the original schedule, but they do hope to still get it built before the end of the decade. Next slide. Um, and you can't see these very well either, but these are uh, five megawatt turbines off the coast of Germany. And um, they're over 300 feet tall. This is a, a boat down here, if you can see, that's like a full size ship, just to give you an idea of scale. These ones are not floating, they're, they're uh, on piers, but it gives you an idea of the scale. Next slide. So we're talking about wind farms on the high seas. This is a, uh, a computer uh, illustration, um, but you get the idea that uh, you could have dozens of these set up in a grid offshore, each one floating, all tethered to the water. They're not just floating free and all tied together with cables, of course, to bring the power onshore. Next slide. 
And there are advantages to going offshore. Uh, you don't have to build a, a big structure. They literally have a smaller footprint, if you will. They don't impact the seabed. And um, you get a better resource. You get more power because there's more wind as you go further offshore. Next slide. Um, I won't go into this detail, but people always ask me, well, how about the birds? Aren't they just macerating birds right and left? Yes, some birds do run into wind turbines, but it turns out many, many more birds die unfortunate deaths from many other sources, mainly human cause. Um, this was several years ago, so the numbers have probably changed, but this gives you an estimate. Um, wind turbines are way down here, half a million birds. That sounds like a lot, but when you see house cats, 100 million birds, um, uh, and hunting power lines, collisions with buildings, is much higher. We're talking billions of birds. It's hard to imagine that many birds dying. If they all died in one day, we'd be horrified. But every day, some of them are running into something out there. And the worst, of course, is habitat destruction. We don't even know the impact there, but it's, it, they're really orders of magnitude greater. So even if you ramped up wind, if you built 100 times more wind turbines, 1,000 times, you wouldn't get into these numbers. And birds do adapt. The, the smart ones figure out how to go around the turbines. They are developing technology to, to avoid those collisions. Next slide. Um, this you can't see very well either, but you can. <laughs> the one you see here, you can't see over there. And this is two miles out, three, four, five, 10, 12. The turbines basically disappear. They're actually going over the horizon of the curvature of the Earth when you get more than 10 or 12 miles out. So they literally are out of sight. And we don't think we'll have the kinds of problems that they've seen with um, Cape Wind and, of course, with onshore uh, terrestrial turbines where people do complain. Next. And they're also connecting them up. Again, it's probably hard to see, but there is a uh, consortium of companies led by a little outfit called Google, you might have heard of. Um, and they've sunk several billion dollars into um, a, a uh, what I like to call an electric superhighway, a, a large power cable that would run on high voltage direct current that would connect up all these different wind farms and pump it all to New York City or to Baltimore, Washington, wherever it needs to go so that it can be had when it's needed. Does that help a little? Um, that's all right. We, we should move on. Okay. Um, so anyway, that's, that's getting built. That's going to be... Um, in, in the first stages up and running in the next five years. And they hope to run it all up and down the East Coast, and there are several similar proposals to build them right offshore of New Hampshire. Uh, actually, they want to connect Seabrook to Boston offshore, uh, but an, an ancillary benefit of that may be that it could connect a wind farm that's also offshore of Seabrook. Um, next slide. Um, this is just a little bit about the, the grid. We need a smarter grid. It's one of the big infrastructure issues of making the whole system more efficient. Uh, Europe has made great strides in this. They have whole utilities that operate on uh, all renewables, wind, solar, biomass, and they just switch very smoothly from one to another when they need them. Um, we have the computer technology to do this. It's just a matter of uh, upgrading and rebuilding the system and uh, reducing the number of, of, you know, these ugly power lines running everywhere, uh, we can build a better system that's much more efficient. Next slide. Economic benefits. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, the main wind uh, project would bring huge amounts of money to the state. They estimate $20 billion total to the state economy. This would be to do the full 5,000 megawatts. We're talking over couple of decades, 16,700 new jobs. Uh, it would stop five billion in energy going out. Obviously, all the, almost all the energy we get now comes from somewhere else, uh, oftentimes foreign countries, oftentimes places that are not very safe or friendly to us. And so it would be much better to generate that at home. And nationally, you get even really big figures, billions and billions of dollars in benefits. So it really is good for the economy. Next slide. Um, I won't go over this too much talk, but this is what people are saying about it. And um, sorry, the, the graphs. The next one. Okay. Um, this is some research that's been done uh, in various places, but uh, BU in particular down in Boston. They've compared the number of jobs created by uh, different types of energy. So the first one is natural gas and coal, then um, uh, the smarter grid, uh, wind. 
solar. The renewables, much more jobs, generally 50 to 100 uh, percent more jobs created by those sources than the traditional fossil fuels. And when you compare uh, renewable energy to, um, or, or uh, yeah, clean energy to uh, military spending, again, getting back to the military question, you see a 50 percent increase in um, jobs from clean energy than you get from the military. And those are comparable jobs. Um, and so a big benefit there in switching to almost anything else is better than the military uh, in terms of job creation. But clean energy is certainly big among those. Next. And back to the ports and naval shipyard, there's an aerial view, probably can't see it too well, but um, how are we doing on time? Oh my God. Yeah, I'll wrap up pretty quick. Uh, but the Ports and Naval Shipyard has huge potential. It could be done as a transition type of thing. They're already diversifying. There are several branches of the military already based at, at uh, Ports and Naval Shipyard. Um, uh, and uh, they could be doing more. And there's even public-private partnerships that have been set up at the shipyard at other military bases around the country. Next slide. Um, they have the technology, they have the infrastructure to do this. Uh, the, the heavy trains, the dock space, the warehouses, deep water access is very important. There's only so many places on the uh, Gulf of Maine that you can bring in big ships and move the kind of cargo we're talking about, um, and they, they have it. Next slide. Um, and also maritime expertise. I wanted to say this a little bit earlier, but you know we have a, a tradition here, a, a long heritage of many hundreds of years of utilizing our, our maritime resources, uh, the wind, the water, the uh, uh, transportation ability, and also the people that know how to build these things. Uh, it's not that different. Obviously, a wind turbine's a little different than a submarine, but a lot of the same technology is used in both. Next. Um, so, could we have a sustainable transition at the shipyard? A lot, of course, depends on what the Department of Defense decides to do, but the fact is there could be things done and are already being done. They've already offered some of their facilities to the University of New Hampshire for some of their projects. U.S. Coast Guard is using facilities there. There are excess facilities uh, um, that, that could be utilized. Um, next. So, what I came up with is a, an acronym is from peak oil to peak wind. In this case, it's a peace transition, environmental renewal, economic renovation, and country independence of energy, self-reliance. Next. And so um, to get to a sustainable future, we need to, uh, these are some of the steps in getting into the policy issues, how we can build a broader uh, coalition of people, engage local and state officials, and I think Rennie will take up some of that or what's been done, starting to be done already in Concord. And last slide, uh, we put together a, a alliance of groups. Uh, we have half a dozen that have joined on, local and state organizations, and uh, gotten a small amount of funding from a couple of funders, and we encourage you to join in. I have a sign-up sheet if you'd like to get on our mailing list for the Wind Assist Alliance. And uh, we also have a petition that we can talk about a little later um, in relation to the governor. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks for your attention. So after listening to Clay and Doug make such compelling arguments for what our energy policy should be and what the future is just waiting for us to claim, I guess the obvious question might be, um, so how come it's not happening as quickly as we might think it should? Um, and just at the outset, I. I kind of, maybe I'm a little qualified as a living fossil, um, because it was in 1968 when I was in Winnicott High School, I was a junior, the Public Service Company of New Hampshire first announced it was going to build a nuclear plant on our state's precious mile, 18 miles of Seacoast, and I was a member of the Seacoast Anti-Pollution League back in 69. Um, but what I remember about that mostly is in 1971 when they had a first public hearing took place, uh, whether or not Seabrook should be the site of, a, of an atomic plant. And I went to testify as a, you know, as a teenage kid, speaking in opposition, and what I remember mostly about that is the site evaluation committee, no one was paying any attention to when I was speaking. And no one paid any attention to anybody else who was speaking until it was time for the utility to make their presentation. And it was as though the class had been called in attention. Um, and there's a, a saying that my my grandfather once told me a long time ago that in a barnyard, the hogs closest to the trough 
get the best slots. And in many ways, I see that replicated all the time. I see the example of that in concrete. Um, why are we in a situation where in 1956, there was, we have a citizen's legislature. In 1956 in New Hampshire, there was a, a lawmaker from New Hampshire, from Manchester, who also happened to be the vice president of the public service company in New Hampshire. So this citizen law legislator brought in a piece of legislation to um, establish an Atomic Energy Act for the state. And it committed the state of New Hampshire to give a priority to the full use of the industrial development of nuclear technology. And for a long time, that became the basis of our state's energy policy. Um, and what's interesting about, what we're not really interesting about is that still is the official energy policy of the state, despite uh, the lessons that we've learned, or what we, sh we should have learned. Um, and as, you know, Clay talked about subsidies, and one of the things about this particular, about the traditional fossil fuels and nuclear technology is that they are the most subsidized forms of energy production that I can think of. Uh, in the construction of the Seabrook Atomic Plant, there was a commitment of, on the part of the state of New Hampshire, over, um, issue over a half a billion dollars of tax-exempt pollution control bonds that was used um, to help finance the construction. That's apart from other subsidies that were issued um, on behalf of the you know, owners of the plant. But it was a straight up, let's, you know, let's issue some bonds and loan it to the company so that they can build this plant that will produce nuclear waste for a long time. It'll be around for a long time. In the discussions that take place in the legislature about what to do with our, uh, what to do with energy policy, um, you know, last year the state finally developed kind of a, you know, uh, an energy strategy, and that energy strategy made a commitment toward, uh, you know, toward a, a transition or toward an aspiration of uh, an energy policy that has moved away from our traditional alliance upon. <clears throat> fossil fuels and, and, and nuclear technology. Um, but sometimes what happens on the way to fulfilling the aspiration is elections happen, so to speak. And I think that what we, we saw last November, the consequences of what took place last November, the impact of the election last November um, really manifested itself the week before last when you saw the legislature uh, you know, vote, or the House anyways, to vote to strip away $50 million that is the, you know, the underpinning, I think, of this transition toward renewable energy in the state of New Hampshire. Um, what would New Hampshire, the House decided is that it, it was going to take money, strip money out of the, the highway, out of, out of the um, renewable energy fund to plow snow, um, to fill what they call a hole in our, initially in our transportation system because 30 million of the 50 million that's being stripped out is going to fix potholes and plow snow. Um, the idea that we have electric rate payers picking up the tab to maintain our highway system is just nonsensical. And this is at the same time the legislature refused to increase the user fee, the road toll, refused to actually use a source of revenue that might be available to maintain our highway and transportation systems. <coughs> this is at the same time that in the, in the capital budget, it stripped out funds for rail transportation. This is at the same time uh, that the legislature refused to end ongoing subsidies for our existing nuclear and coal plants. I will tell you, for the past <coughs> couple of years, the, the subsidies that, that go on for the Seabrook Atomic Plant, and for the Bull Plant, and for the, uh, the, the Newington plants, for our large uh, power plants, there's a very, there, there is a, an interesting law that was passed in 1950, again, in, in the 1950s, it was renewed in 1970, that provides for an exemption for taxation from local property tax for certain components of nuclear and coal and gas-fired plants. Um, that, that end up subsidizing the very operation of those plants. Uh, one of the things that I've been trying to do for the past four years is, if nothing else, just strip that subsidy out. Because it's a subsidy that uh, goes to help underwrite the continued operation 
of power plants that we really don't want to have operating here anymore. But it's, at the same time, it's also, because it's a tax expenditure, it's forcing the state to forego revenue. So at the same time we're stripping $50 million out of the Renewable Energy, Energy Fund, we refuse to repeal the tax exemption that takes $7.2 million a year out of the Education Trust Fund to subsidize our coal and nuclear plants. And the reason that takes place, quite frankly, is, is, is who shows up. This, uh, you know, earlier th th this winter, you can tell how much interest there is in a particular issue in the legislature by the number of orange badges. And so when the bill came to repeal the subsidy for the, for the, oil, for the coal and for the nuclear plants, there was, it was wall-to-wall -wall orange badges from the business. Yeah, orange, I'm telling you, orange badges are the badges that, the hunter orange, they're, they're, the, they're the badges that lobbyists are required to, to, to serve, to, to, to use. So here you've got an existing tax subsidy, you know, corporate welfare is the, is the accurate word. You have a, a corporate welfare program that harms the environment um, and calls itself pollution control tax exemption that's supported by the Business and Industry Association, by Next Era, by Eversource, by, you know, everybody, every, every lobbyist had a piece of that action to maintain what, caught, what amounts to ongoing millions of dollars of subsidies for, you know, for for stuff that doesn't make any sense for us to be subsidizing. Um, I share that with you because at the same time, trying to strip away the subsidies for this, uh, you know, kind of the energy of the, of the past, uh, we, you know, as Doug, had, as Doug alluded to, two years ago, we initiated, or a year, two years ago, there was a bill that was passed by the legislature that set up a study committee to look at this whole question of offshore wind. Um, and the nexus between the subsidies for the old and the, you know, the reluctance or the unwillingness to help to, to look at other energy sources is what um, drives me crazy. Anyway, there was a study committee that, that, based on Doug's suggestion, that was set up that took a look at this, the, the question of potential of offshore wind. And we took a look at it. Um, uh, and what we really need, what we came to decide is that we needed to, con to continue to support the development of this, to take the initial steps to create, uh, to, to do an inventory, if you will, to try to look at this from not a perspective of just the narrow um, 18 miles of seacoast, but to take a look at it from the, ex from the, the portion of our um, offshore that goes from, from Cape Ann, to, to Portland, which just it makes sense. Um, and we came up with a recommendation to the governor to initiate a process in conjunction with the state of Maine, in conjunction with the state of Massachusetts, to have the Bureau of Energy off, yeah, BOEM, Bureau of Offshore, of, Energy, of, Energy, of, Offshore Energy, Energy Management, my acronyms don't, always, which is the, the agency that has, the federal agency that has jurisdiction over the development of offshore wind for lack of, you know, lack of, just to put it quickly. Um, and that was a policy, it was a two, couple of policy recommendations. Um, one of them is that the governor initiate a process to do that, um, and also that we continue to, as a legislature, have a commitment to, to, to monitor, to, to support the, the further development. Um, but unfortunately, when, that, when a bill came earlier this year to continue that process, my colleagues in the legislature saw, you know, decided that what well, we'd had enough. We wanted it was not a good way to invest our state's resources. I know Doug has talked, made reference to um, to a, a, a petition that's going. But one of the things that we'd like to do, and we, we're hoping that the governor, using the authority that she has as the chief executive, <clears throat> would at least would begin and it would initiate a process to have the Bureau of Offshore Energy Management begin um, a, a process to help uh, create an you know, inventory to, to try to take a look at what uh, the actual potentiality is for the development of our offshore energy off, off our coast. Um, and I think, I'm hopeful that that will be something that, uh, that, she, will, that she will affirmatively take up. Um, 
I don't know how much, I, I think that's just a quick overview. It may not be as coherent, coherent come together, but we can have conversations. And I just, I really want to thank my colleagues because they laid the case on why we need a different energy. Folks to ask questions, make comments, um, if that's okay. I think what we're really looking forward to is what we can do, and there's a petition that's going around um, with some specifics, which we got some input, and there's two. So, where yeah. yours? One specific is, to wind power. Okay, um, and the one that's going. I don't know where is it. The same. Okay. The table. There's there's that. We can pass them around um, the wind assist and also here. Um, but I just like to open it up to questions from folks and. about the um, membership of the Public Utilities Commission and the extent of their power related to what we're talking about here. I, I, could, I could. So the, the Public Utilities Commission is, is three commissioners appointed by the governor. Um, they are, as, a, as an agency, um, part of the executive branch, they're directed by, legislate, by legislation to adopt rules and, and programs. They have very little power when it comes to the legislative's authority to control the budget. Um, so they've tried in the past to secure the funds and commit them so that the legislature can't touch them, and they've done a pretty good job. But when you do a wholesale raid of the fund, there's not much left for the Public Utilities Commission uh, to do. The Public Utilities Commission is made up of divisions. One of the divisions is the Sustainable Energy Division. One of them is the electric division. Um, there are some folks in the electric division who, who are you know, stuck uh, about a decade ago um, in their calculations of the value of solar and things like this. You see states all over the country uh, assessing this question because you get, there's, there's been a memo sent around by the utilities industry that talks about solar energy and distributed generation eating into their bottom line profits. Uh, that memo has been replicated over and over again and um, the Electric Division of the Public Utilities Commission, for the most part, I'm not trying to insult anybody in specific, in specifically, have adopted some of the provisions of that memo. And they refuse to account for the societal and the non-economic benefits of distributed generation. And they also ignore certain economic benefits that can be identified. And so you have an agency that's, that has three appointees who uh, rule on issues related to these things. And you have a... a uh, division of that agency that's that is a little behind the times um, and so we haven't implemented this this review of the value of solar but uh, the, in, in my class we just finished a segment reviewing 12 other states that have every single state except for one has found out that the value of solar exceeds the cost and so it's actually in the benefit of the state to do more distributed energy because of the the securing of the funds in the state offsetting of, of uh, generation of solar energy at, at peak times, that all these economic and non-economic benefits far outweigh the costs associated with it. The only state that found it against it was Louisiana, and now they found out that the consultant that did the work had strong ties to the oil and gas industry. Go figure. Um, I know, I couldn't believe it. So, so the, P, the PUC will sometimes send recommendations, but and try and, um, but they normally, and I don't know, maybe Randy can correct me on this, they won't take strong policy positions with the legislature because their job is to follow what the legislature does. But they, I, I've noticed recently that they, they have started looking more favorably and, and trying to say, you know, these programs are in place, they're working. The original incentive level was like $1.75 a watt, it's now down to 80 cents. So it's, it's a sign that the program is working, and I think that consistency and that decline has shown the, the commissioners, at least, and, and some of the members of, of the various divisions, that, hey, this is a program that makes sense, let's keep doing it and, and go forward. But they don't have independent authority uh, from the legislature if they're not if the, at that uh, budgetary state. You're welcome. When you said, Clay, that the leadership has to come from us in some ways, um, in a lot of ways, is, where are the pressure points that you see, looking at that kind of whole picture? Is the pressure points on our legislators solely? I mean, in Exeter, we're very fortunate we have this little cadre of people who tend to be liberal on this, but, but how else do we impact? And I guess I'd like to ask that for each of you, is where do you see the, the best impact that we can have? I'll, I'll let you guys go first, because I just... Well, I... You know, I I'll, Elections have consequences. Um, there is the legislature that you have 
in Concord right now, generally speaking, is not that sympathetic toward issues that relate to the environment. Um, and the legislature is the, the group that, you know, the budget is a policy document. It's a values document. And the budget that's been proposed, that's in place, it's not, I have to say, it's not just, it's not just an attack on clean energy and on energy standards. It's an attack on you know, many people who live at the margins of our society. I, I could spend a whole lot of time saying, what else, what else is being created in an attack? But we're trying to focus on that. The energy question. Right now. Um, you know, I think that I think our governor does a you know does a good job trying to have a, a forward-looking energy policy, but it's not the personnel in place in the legislature are such that I don't think that's going to be an easy task. You know, that, that, that's a good question. If you're, you know, in a place that supports it, what can you do outside? You know, we, I did, this is, I, you know, this kind of a pitch uh, because I was the president of the organization, but it, it, the New Hampshire Sustainable Energy Association is a statewide voice. And so, you know, they do, they, pro, they provide a lot of outreach and support for people that want to get a voice more on a state level. If that organization continues to grow and continues to get support, you know, some folks look at that and say, okay, people are starting to take it, you know, advantage or to be, become aware and, and the, it's very easy to become a member, it's, it's cost effective. They're starting to do more and more uh, outreach and work with citizens so you get money for your membership. Uh, it's really um, started to attract significant grants from funders because of the efforts and the work that uh, the NHSEA has done. So if that's one opportunity, and I, you know, I know there's a thousand groups you can join, but if that's, that's one way that, you know, in, in a place like Exeter, you can have a more statewide voice by being a part of an organization like that that's committed to it. I, I, just, I, you know, I have to make an observation. There are forces that are in play that directly have an attempt to influence and are somewhat successful um, who it is that serves in our New Hampshire legislature. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a group Americans for Prosperity that is funded by a family that's pretty well known to be, have strong interest in the existing energy fields, uh, the Koch brothers. And I, you know, I don't want to be glib and, you know, attribute everything, every, everything that goes bad to the Koch brothers' influence. But the reality is, it's kind of, there's been a drilling down not just at the you know the top levels in, in Congress, but it's down to the state legislative <coughs> levels. So that when somebody from you know Americans for Prosperity or another you know another front group uh, you know s s says that this is a bad policy, this is anti-business. Everything usually gets couched in you know this is anti-business. Well, anti-business is really anti-big business, but it's anti-business. Um, they have an impact. Sort of going back to Pat's question about what we can do, um, the budget is now in the Senate, and we all have a state senator, and depending upon your town, it's a different one. But what I'm doing is I'm sitting here listening to the fact that we're talking about policy that is going to kill jobs in our communities right now, in the solar industry. We've got policy that is working against um, using our naval shipyard in a way that is positive and moving forward. And I didn't take notes, but I heard a lot of stuff from each of you that would make a very great strong letter to your state senator saying we need to make sure that fund is not rated. We need to make sure that their budget is a forward-thinking budget and is not going to put New Hampshire further and further behind other New England states it would be great to be able to quote those 11 states that have done that energy analysis of solar that could go in the letter. What, what I find the Senate and, and Thinking House members respond to is, what are things that support jobs in our communities? What are things that support the small businesses? I hear a lot out of Concord all the time about how we are a state made up of small businesses. And things pass when the legislators know that what they're voting on is going to directly affect people that work in their communities. And so I think that your letters to senators on those points and CC the governor, so the governor is already aware that there's a push, it can make a difference if you call them out on the fact that they're killing jobs. So 
it would be great if someone was taking great notes and could summarize some of those points that directly deal with that. And I, you could CC your state legislators who are going to get the budget back at some point. There, you know, the process does have a compromise, but it, you know, it's in the Senate now, and they have the power. One of, maybe you know, I mentioned, I mentioned thirty million of the fifty million to go into the highways, but that other twenty million is, it's out there because we're cutting money for people, you know, Meals on Wheels has gone out the door so that we can't have a contact that maybe the only contact for an elderly person with somebody else that's being on the block. Mental illness, there's no beds for, to take care of people with, you know, who are mentally ill that's going out the block. Homeless shelters, there's no money that's going into homeless shelters. Victims of domestic violence, there's no money that's going into that. Um, I will, you know, the, 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 you talk about cutting your nose the tourism industry, Bring all the money out of the tourism promotion because we broke a promise on, on that level. Let's just that's talking about jobs. I mean, downshifting to local communities and property taxes. What's going to happen to people with children with development disabilities? There, there. That's what that, it's. This competition, and they're going. And so what you're saying is we have to take the money out of the renewable energy, energy fund in order to, you know, in order to feed the elderly, in order to take care of children with development disabilities, in order to educate our people, because. We can. I can speak loud enough. I just want to explain that, uh, and you all know this, we have suffered, um, we, we've been uh, dealing with a shortage of funding uh, to run New Hampshire for a long time. The bottom line is we need alternative sources of tax revenue, whether it's sales tax, income tax, or some other tax. We are running out of enough money to fund the services that our people need. And so that's really the bottom line. And I know it's been the New Hampshire way to have no taxes from Mel Thompson era forward. But they just can't continue. We have to find other sources of revenue to run this state. Maybe Clay could uh, relate the 11 states if he remembers them. Vermont, New Jersey slash Pennsylvania did one together. Minnesota, California, uh, damn. Uh, dang. I don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> That's Louisiana. Uh, yeah, I can, what I'll do, Mar I can actually send the links. All the reports are on Blackboard, my UNH class. I can send you links to the reports, and I can send you the NHSEA framework letter that they put out for uh, sending to the senators. Um, and then, if you become a member, you'll get this stuff automatically through, the, you know, once you get on the email list. But um, they, in that, it talks about uh, the state energy strategy, the jobs, the success of the renewable energy fund, and kind of lays out you know some bullet points for a good memo. Not that meant to be a talking points memo. It's just it's to help you do your research so that you can draft your own uh, letter to your senator or other senators. Um, so I will I will send you the link to all the reports as well as some slides that my class did. Each uh, I broke my class up into groups. They each analyzed each report and tried to report out the report in a, in a coherent you know, coherent fashion so that you could. Uh, compare the results of the study, and, and that that way, you know, the hope is we don't need to do our own study because every other state has done it, and it's and it's coming out the same no matter where you go. Is that um, I have a thing that Kate Epson did with the bullet yep. points of yep, that, so it. that's okay. So I have that, and we can put it on the website for views, so you can all then I'll, we'll let you know when it's going to be on there. But that's good. Does it do any good to write letters to legislators who aren't from our districts? <laughs> I don't think it has a whole lot of, I mean, everything has its value, but I don't particularly, um, you know, if I get a letter from somebody from Epson, somebody from Epson, it's a little more important than if I get from somebody from Indiana, <laughs> which I get to all the time. Yeah. But I think there's nothing like, you know, but certainly anybody, your own elected official, that's who you're sponsored for. Uh, and if you contribute to other people's campaigns, they usually will pay attention to you, but other than that. I mean, I'm not trying to discourage civic involvement, but um, you know, do something publicly. Send a public, an open letter has more, to, to in general, I think has more impact than a personal letter to somebody who doesn't know you and you don't have a relationship with. It's about relationships. Any other comments here? Maybe Martin first and then Jim. 
Pine and Martin Myers. Um, I spent 20 years with Royal Oak Shell, um, eight years at Cambridge Energy Research Associates, that some of you heard of, a little while with uh, Irving Oil, and the last eight years I've been working with a company called Photon Consulting, which uh, of course uh, consults to the global um, uh, PV industry. And so one of the things that I think we can say, you know, sort of just objective truth is that um, the kind of policies that governments put in place uh, have huge impact on sort of the sustainable development of solar power and uh, or of a solar power industry. And as many of the panelists pointed out, um, European countries were, well, so it's, it's actually very interesting, sort of the first big push for solar came in Japan and went from about the mid-90s to the early 2000s and then starting in Germany with the EEG, which stands for Energy Transformation in German. Um, and then multiple other countries have put uh, country, uh, sort of policy with very strong solar power installation incentives in place. Spain, Italy, Germany, the Czech Republic, the list is, you know, goes, goes on for a while. And one of the things that we've learned from just observing that is that there's an enormous danger of a massive boom and bust cycle. And so uh, the fantastic benefits of, or, you know, the, the, the benefits of putting um, solar power, install, installing solar power, which includes a lot of jobs, um, if policy structures aren't designed to sustain this industry over a long period of time, uh, can make that industry very vulnerable. Um, you know, the hundreds of thousands of jobs turn into tens of thousands very quickly um, if the way that the policy is structured is not thought through for the long term. Um, and so, you know, that's a very long discussion. Um, I'd say, uh, notwithstanding sort of the, the studies that have been done that point out that potentially distributed generation um, can be beneficial for the um, sort of the, uh, the 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 system that we depend on for our daily lives. Um, again, without careful design of policies and rate structures, um, you know, distributed generation can actually have very significant impacts on um, the sustainability, the economic and financial sustainability of what we depend on from a day to day perspective. And so I'm not standing here saying, you know, I understand all of the ramifications of this and nor that, um, um, you know, there, there's a lot of risk with going down this path at all. It's more um, that it is a very complex subject and that having, um, like I said, sort of, incentive policies and also kind of rate making policies. I think one of the biggest challenges that we face here is how um, fragmented the policy making and the regulatory structures are and that um, you know really kind of steps in the right direction can hit roadblocks um, for some of the reasons that the panelists have talked about and for many other reasons as well. And um, I would, you know, I, I, I mean, on a daily basis, it's, it's what I spend a lot of time working on, and um, it's wonderful to see, you know, this topic being discussed with this group here. Um, it, the, I, I guess I'd say that uh, it's a long road ahead, and at the end of that road, I certainly, I mean, I've watched, you know, the, I thought the, one, here's, here's another metric for you. At the time that the system at the um, high school was put in, kind of the global price for a solar module or panel was about $4 a watt. Today, that same module sells for about 70 cents. And it's exactly the same technology, effectively. It's not a technology game, it's a scale game. And we have a very large scale manufacturing system globally now for solar power components. The question is not, is it competitive cost-wise? The, the question is really about, can we build policies and um, 
uh, rate structures that you know that, that give us a reliable system that we all depend on so that our sump pumps work when you know and like all the things that we expect on a day-to-day -day basis um, and that is sustainable um, in the many different kind of definitions of that word so it's a it's a I think that, that the three panelists talked about you know in really interesting elements of the complexity and um, it's not a reason not to push really hard for it. I think it's just a reason, I think it's just good for all of us to be aware that there are these complexities. What are we going to do? Hi, I'm Jim Weber. Uh, so what are we going to do at the end of Climate Justice Month on April 25th and 26th? Jim is the straight man, which is not right. We have a different word for that, I guess. Now, uh, um, part of what this is a whole effort that this church is doing for a month of climate justice, and um, part of what we're doing is some education, but also we're doing a public visibility to get to the streets, and um, we're, we're going to be in Concord on Earth Day, which is April twenty second. Um, with the petition and also with the big banner, but called "Lead Us, Lead Us to Clean Energy," um, and we're here in Exeter on Saturday, April 25th, from 10:30 to noon, and also at UNH at Solar Fest on Sunday. Um, through that's through my work with 350 New Hampshire, um, some of that. But we really invite all of you to come to be part of the petition signing um, to be visible and i think what when we said this lead us to clean energy it's really kind of a double message which is if you don't lead us we will lead you um, and that's really the importance of showing up and participating and bringing people from other towns who may have representatives who are not from exeter and not sympathetic to this i think reaching out and connecting to more people um, is going to be very important. Thank you for the question, Jim. Yes? You might want to mention some people here might not know about the uh, workshop next Saturday and Sunday. Right. There's a workshop also next all day Saturday and half a Sunday um, with a woman, uh, Colleen McConnell, from, who's done a lot of work with Joanna Macy on the work that reconnects. And part of her work is about how you deal with the emotional, psychological, all of that spiritual part of it, and then the last part of it is called going forth, which is what are we going to do about it and how do we move from um, contemplation and all of that into action. So we hope if you haven't signed up, there's room, there's about, we anticipate about 30 people, yes. uh, and it's a wonderful, wonderful workshop. But. And is all of this on our church website? All of it is on the website. Um, all of it's available. And people from the public are totally invited. This is not just a, we're again trying to reach out here. I, I just, I, I, th I thought some of your comments are, are enlightening. Um, and I want to enlighten more. Um, there's a difference. Germany has got to a point where they can almost produce all the power they need on the grid from solar. Germany has the sun resource of Alaska. Um, our cap in New Hampshire is 0.3 percent. So I don't, you know, I, I respect that we need to look at this globally in terms of rate structures and decoupling and all these other complicated wonky things. There was, the state energy strategy does that. But instead of implementing the straight state energy strategy and talking about these issues, which we were prepared to do before the election, we've been running around in defensive mode trying to save the renewable portfolio standard, save the renewable energy fund, and we can't push that discussion forward. So, you know, we need to take a, a measure of progress toward where we need to be, but 0.3% is a joke. And having to defend these common sense things that were bipartisan passed, you know, against the legislature that's on this tear, is, we don't have time for that. You know, I, I, you, you need to know the climate science out there. And, and if you doubt it, I'm sorry. But I, mean, I, deal with, I, I meet with Cameron Wake on a daily basis. I work with him on another project. We're trying to quantify the value of ecosystem services in the state of New Hampshire. We're modeling the entire state impact um, you know, of climate change. And it's, it's coming. And, and you know, this, something has got to get done. If not for you, do it for your children and your grandchildren who are going to see the impacts of this. And, and, and this debate about climate change is over. It's, it's just over. And, and 
if the, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I never want to get on this soapbox about it, but it's just, I've seen the data. Yeah, we had a cold winter, but if you look at the globe and you look at what's going on, the patterns are disrupted. The absorption of heat into the ocean is tremendous. The ice, you know, it's just, it's a nightmare. And, and it really is time to start having a mature discussion about all the issues. But, but where we are in New Hampshire, we're not close. And, and that, that's kind of my position. And we have a majority leader of the House who does not accept that climate change is real. I mean, and that's just, that's the reality that we have to deal with. It. So I, I think, like, just if I may, um, I think that you can probably all hear me very quickly, is that um, the economics really should be driving the transition. So yes, you know, climate change is a huge issue, and if you stripped away all the, you know, if you, if you got to basic economics, that would be enough, from my perspective, to actually start to drive the transition. And so the, the question is not about putting big incentives in place one way or the other, it's about leveling the playing field so that, you know, the, I mean, you can get solar power on your roof if you can get a good, you know, a low price loan, you can get solar power on your roof and, and it's going to cost, you know, 12 cents a kilowatt hour, something like that is below today's um, uh, rates that we have to pay. Yeah, I just wanted to add, it's great to hear all these comments because these are exactly the same things we were saying 10, 15 years ago about leveling the planning field. I was involved actually in the development uh, from an uh, outsider standpoint of the Renewable Energy Standard, the RPS, about 10 years ago. Uh, I actually wore one of those orange tags that Rennie referred to for a nonprofit, mind you, for clean water action. Uh, but there was a lot of discussion about all these details, and without getting into a lot of the details, um, we, we had the advantage of being one of the last states, at least in New England, to develop a renewable energy standard. And we actually learned somewhat from the other states and how to do it a little better. And one of the issues was developing uh, different uh, categories and having a different goal <clears throat> uh, or limit, if you will, for each of those, and also having a provision to <clears throat> change it as uh, developments dictate. And I was looking forward to, you know, three years hence to be able to come in and say, no, 0.3%, whatever, is way too small. It needs to be larger. So, you know, I understand we have to be defensive, we have to protect what we've done so far, but we do need to be proactive as well. And, and you know, the current legislature obviously isn't open to this, but um, we have to look forward to the next legislature, hopefully in 2016. You know, there is another election coming up pretty darn soon, and um, we, we can uh, do more and, and improve things further. But it's, I mean, but I just, two things. One, you know, you can't conflate politics with economics because the decisions to be made are political and not about any kind of economic basis. Um, and the other thing is, it, quite frankly, it, we, we really, you know, I hate to have to be in a defensive mode. We really need to have this defensive fight. We need to make this stand because if this gets ripped out, if there's $50 million, if, it's, if that's vacuum, it's, it's got to be a setback because your ability to come back in two years and to start all over again, it's not, it's too devastating. I mean, we need to stand up now and not let it happen. So, see, now we're going. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I, I uh, you know, in my, my, do you guys know Cameron Wake? He's a, he's a paleoclimatologist at UNH. He does a lot of this research. Um, he's published a lot of reports specific to New Hampshire and climate impacts. We, one of the things he says that is most exciting and, and directly responds to you, you know, responding appropriately to the impacts of climate disruption and change is the economic opportunity of this century. Because, you know, these things are money-saving devices. If you build a new home and finance a solar array in the mortgage, you will always save money. Because you're going to pay less, you'll, the, the, the cost in the mortgage is dwarfed by the savings on the electric bill. No new home in New Hampshire should, should be built without solar. Because you're, you're, you're shooting yourself in the foot. And, and so these are the kind of simple metrics and discussions that should go out there. If you create more in, you know, if, uh, insulation in your home and use heat pumps, you can build a net zero home, finance it into your, your mortgage, and it's a cost saving. Everybody thinks, oh, it's expensive. It's not. It's just that's mythology that's perpetuated by people on the other side of the argument that want to stop it. That, and that's it. I, I, I'm sorry to call it out, but I'm going to call it out. 
and this is about truth, right? Isn't that one of the one of the three right. principles here? <laughs> right. <laughs> so, in, so it's it's important to to see through some of that stuff and recognize this as opportunity, you know, for the future, and it, and it really is. And so that I just wanted to say that. I just want to make one other comment on the economics because. I love it when people, oh, we, we, we have a free market, right? We want to have free market in energy. And I go, we are so far from a free market in energy, and particularly electricity. I mean, if Seabrook didn't teach us how screwed up things are, our, our current situation with our coal power plants, which I don't think it's been mentioned enough, um, there's, there's a renewed effort now to divest, to require PSNH to sell the plants. To my mind, we're not doing it soon enough, should have been done 10 years ago, we shouldn't be bailing them out, but the basic idea of getting them off of the energy generation and the subsidization uh, of uh, dirty power, uh, you know, the absurdity of running a plant like Bo that, that has a scrubber that costs half a billion dollars, but the plant's only worth 50 million, I mean, this is literally what this, the, the spreadsheet is showing us now, and we're gonna end up bailing them out for the remainder. <coughs> very screwed up economics, so we need to get back to a, a, a better system with proper signals in it, and those are just some of the steps. One other point I wanted to make is we all consume electricity, unless you're completely off the grid, you're probably connected to one of these, uh, uh, most people on Unitil here? Or, yeah. um, you have some choice, I, I assume, I'm, I'm guessing Unitil has this option, or you can choose your supplier, and you can choose, uh, I know I can, uh, I have PSNH, but I get it from another outfit. I'm not selling any particular one, I don't get a commission, but you can choose to get 100% renewable. You pay maybe 10, 20% more, but if you want to walk the talk, you know, that's one way to do it in your basic purchasing of energy. You can also get biofuels, there are a lot of things, and obviously, as Clay has been mentioning many times, we can all do more to build our own solar if you have that ability in your home. It's getting easier and easier. So we can all do things as consumers as well as citizens, as voters, taxpayers, etc. Um, find you know a way you can participate. Yeah. I wanted to mention one other event coming up since we were talking about upcoming events. There's a film that's um, going to be shown. It's on Earth Day to celebrate Earth Day. That's uh, Wednesday, April 22nd. It's called The Wisdom to Survive. Climate Change, Capitalism, and Community. It's a very interesting film, um, mostly uh, developed by folks over in Vermont, Bill McKibben in particular, you probably, I know he's spoken here before, um, and that's going to be at the Portsmouth Public Library at 6.30 p.m. on Wednesday the 22nd. It's free, open to the public, hope you can come. I'll leave this uh, flyer, you can post it, so uh, keep that in mind as well on Earth Day. I think in the interest of um, time, do you want to do one more, Chris? Or? Yeah, okay. I, guess I can yell. It's yeah. all right. <laughs> um, in terms of just the basic logic of this whole thing, it makes sense to me, and granted I choose to be in a community where we talk about the interconnected web of all things, um, you know, that as animals, if we destroy our habitat, kind of nothing else matters. And as a psychologist, I'm having trouble understanding how people can be in complete denial about something so basic. And since you all are in the fight, I would like some language just that when someone comes back and is in complete denial that this is an issue, what what is reasonable to say? At what level do you, what is effective in terms of communication? Oh boy, that's a great one. <laughs> I don't know if you've seen the movie The Matrix. Um, there's a monologue in it where uh, the computer uh, it kind of is talking to a human through through another like a like a, a generated uh, person called Agent Smith, um, and and he, he equates human beings to a virus, <laughs> and so the, and, and and that that's one answer you know it, that we we do deplete and there's nothing we can do about it. we just replicate we deplete and you know we're destroying our environment. My, my advice to you, and this is coming over um, years and years of beating my head against the wall on a variety of issues, um, is pick your battles. There are some people that you're just not going to convince. Stop talking to those people. Talk to the people who will listen and, and talk to the people who need some support and continue to build the community. There will always be a group of people who just will not respond. That's why we still kill people in wars. 
and, and so, and, and sadly, in the name of religion, mostly. So it, it just, for me, I, I had to have this cathartic experience, you know, where I understood that not everyone is going to like me. Uh, that was the hardest part. <laughs> <laughs> not everyone is going to believe what I say, which is what my mom has been telling me all my life. I call her up to say thank you. And, and, and stick with the people that, that are, you know, kind of on the fence. I, you know, I don't want to go the independent voter thing or something like that, but just, there are people that you can recognize that want to talk about it and learn. And then there are people that are just dug in. You're going to spend so much energy trying to beat your head against that wall that it's just not worth it. And so I would just say, figure out who that person is, where they belong on that bell curve of, you know, tolerance and, and listening, and then just, you know, give them a hug, feel sorry for them, and move on to the next person. <laughs> That's my answer. Yeah, and I would, I would basically concur with that. Um, some of you may know, in an earlier part of my life, I spent many, many uh, hours and evenings and years, in fact, going door to door, talking to people. I sort of felt like an itinerant preacher. But one thing you figure out doing that work, and to, to be successful at it, you can't talk to everybody. You've got to pick and choose your battles, as he says. And you figure out which people are open to you. And find common ground. You know, the, the four S's I mentioned. Pick any one of those. Are people concerned about security? Are they concerned about energy independence? You know, emphasize those points. You're not going to win with everybody. We don't need to win everybody. We are the majority. I mean, we, we have to keep reminding ourselves. Most people do get it, at least about climate disruption. You know, there are a minority that don't get it, and some are very loud about not getting it. But uh, ignore those people. <laughs> Deal with the people that can be moved and get more of those people involved. Say, look, you've got to get out and vote. You know, you've got to stand up for these things if this matters to you because it really does matter. It's, it's all our futures. So, um, you know, work with those people. So I think we should uh, close up here for the day, but thank you all of you. Really wonderful. with you on this. So, um, Clay, we're going to infiltrate your classes, okay? Is that good? And thank all of you for coming. There, uh, the petitions are here. If you'd like it, we'll be here a few more minutes. Men barricades, right? Yay! Human the barricades. <laughs>